Um, Rufus has explained that I got a little sampling here of business school students and law school students and varying degrees of understanding about you know, what venture capital is all about and where it fits into the ecosystem. So we're going to try to hit sort of a common denominator and not get too granular with uh, terminology that might go over the heads of too many of you. Uh, and the idea is not to come away from this with you know, thinking that you can then go and uh, advise somebody or negotiate on your own behalf a venture, a venture uh, investment from, from an enterprise, but just to understand where the kind of what we do for a living uh, and the, the thought process processes that we go through in deciding whether we're going to put money behind uh, a management team that has a startup, a growth stage company that is out there looking for capital that's not yet ready for the other types of capital providers in the market, you know, such as private equity groups, um, or certainly not for commercial banks, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to put that? Yep. Um, so we, we're from Safeguard Scientific, and as Rufus has said, we, Safeguard is a company that's been around uh, since 1953. We don't call, we're, we're not a venture capital fund. We are, we are a publicly traded company. Um, we engage ourselves in putting money into enterprises that are most typically funded by venture funds and groups that, that do the style of investing that, that we do. We, we add on uh, some layers to that, and it, it's what we hope differentiates us um, from venture funds. First of all, we, we, we are investing money off of our own balance sheet. So, most venture funds are structured in a way that they go out and raise money from limited partners who want to give a select group of individuals the ability to take their money, aggregate it, and invest it among, let's call it, you know, if you, in, in a typical fund of $100 million, you're probably going to have uh, investments that, in it, that would range from anywhere from 10 to 20 companies, maybe. Um, we, differently, have money that is evergreen on our balance sheet. So our capital is what we turn around and put into our, our partner companies, as we call them. Um, and when those companies get sold, we take that money back in, and instead of delivering it out to a set of limited partners, we just roll that money back onto our balance sheet and so hopefully what we're doing is taking $1 from the balance sheet, turning it into $3 on the balance sheet, taking those $3 and deploying it out, and multi you know, the multiplier effect, obviously, is what we're trying to accomplish. Um, right now, we focus on healthcare and technology, pretty broad um, focus, uh, and there's a lot of subcategories under that. Um, but just to compare apples to oranges, we don't invest, we don't put money into you know, green technology. Uh, we're not looking at consumer-based kind of uh, undertaking. So we, we wouldn't be putting money into a Google, just, be, just because that's not what we think we know. Uh, not that we wouldn't have loved to, to have extracted those kind of results from a, uh, from a company, but we have, we have a group of leaders of our uh, deal teams, as we call them, who know specific subsectors of the industries that we play in, and therefore base our capital deployments on that industry knowledge. So we're just not betting that somebody has a great idea and they'll be able to turn it into something. We, we are very dependent upon our understanding of what, where these different industries are going and where the next innovation is going to be, uh, how, these, how these entrepreneurs fit into what we view as the, the, where the world is going within those sectors. Uh, we have 24 partner companies right now. Um, our goal over time is to continue to grow that number, to diversify the base of assets that we have money in, um, to continue to develop a very uh, predictable exit pattern. So the more companies we have and the more consistently we put money to work, we want those uh, to sell at some point. And the, the more often they sell, um, and hopefully they're successful exits, we, we're putting more money on the balance sheet, our stock price will grow, et cetera, and we're accomplishing what we want to do uh, with our company. Um, we put, we'd like to put five to $15 million to work in a given enterprise. 
um, to start with. That in and of itself is one of the determining factors that will play into whether we will talk to a group or, or won't <coughs> consider talking to a group that's looking for venture money because we don't want to put a million dollars to work. That doesn't move our needle. We want to put five million dollars to work. Many, many uh, opportunities that we see don't need five million dollars. It would be stupid for them to take five million dollars from us because we'd end up owning the whole company. So that's one of the defining things that, that help us figure out you know, who we put money into and who we don't. Over the course of a company's lifetime, we try to put 10 to 25 million total into a company. So while we start out, we'd like to start out with five. We never, we don't, we don't want to get above 25 because, of, and that is directly due to how much capital we presently have, uh, as well as the kind of companies that we feel we, we, we will do the best in. That's something that that will. That there's an analogy to not only how we do business, but how venture funds do business that are based on the same kind of principles. When you have a certain size fund, a certain size fund will want to deploy certain amounts of capital um, to keep its assets diversified. It will want to put at least a certain amount of money to work to move its needle, et cetera. So it's, it, while we're not the same as a venture fund, it's the same principles that apply. Um, we, unlike a lot of venture funds, do like to own a significant portion of the companies that we put money into. We don't want to own 10% and say, call us every quarter and let us know how you're doing. We get actively involved. We like to own enough of a company where we really matter to a company and that, <clears throat> that, that we are an important partner, which is, you know, to go back to why we call these partner companies, not, not, not portfolio companies, et cetera, just to get across the idea that we really do help these companies uh, and aren't just throwing money at them. We, we help them figure out how, to, how they're going to be successful. Um, Go to, go to the next slide. So what we thought we'd do today is just to give you a sense. We're not going to. There's no way we're going to teach you, um, you know, all the terminology that you'll need to know uh, if you want, if you have entrepreneurial instincts and want to go out and figure out how to start raising capital, or if you want to be a lawyer eventually that does this kind of work. But we'll, you know, we'll throw in a sprinkling of the kind of things, the kind of terminology that's utilized. But more importantly, we'll give you a sense of the kind of things we think about. Uh, when someone walks in our door and says, I got this great idea, um, and here's why you should you know, uh, put money into us. So the, the first thing that we look at are the factors that, we, that we've thrown up there. Uh, I'll ask Seth to maybe address, because Seth comes, comes, to, comes here today from our deal team. So Seth, his role in the company is much more. If I were to divide the world or divide the world at all between the the work that Jason does and the work that uh, Seth does, Seth is on the side of the business. It's just, it's uh, its biggest his biggest concern is assessing whether when a company walks in from the standpoint of opportunity value, there's something to, something to look at. If somebody walks in and says, "I've got the best dog collar you can imagine," I mean. That's a different story than if someone walks in and says, I have a technology that will allow the airline industry to run its planes much more efficiently. Obviously, there's, you know, there, there's both our entrepreneurial uh, endeavors, maybe, but there's certain things that we're not going to look at, out, even if they're within our industry focus. Uh, and that's more of Seth's job. So maybe I'll have Seth to, to touch upon some of those, those kind of factors. Sure. So, um on uh, you know, sort of when we come and look at a company, I'd say the first screen we look at is what what market is the company focused on. So within both healthcare and technology, we have a couple of specific verticals that we look at. Um, so within healthcare, we won't look at a company that's a biotech company. Um, we won't look at, at at a medical device company that has a, that has to go through a pre market approval and has a lot of regulatory risk. So there are certain. Um, thing and, and similar in technology, you know, Brian mentioned we won't look at Google. Well, Google is a technology company, you know, but in many ways it's a very consumer focused technology company. And for the folks that we have on the team, um, that's not their area of expertise. So there are sort of specific verticals, and that's probably the first screen that we look at. Um, if it passes that screen, you know, then we're going to look at um, a number of company specific factors. So, um, oh, and I, the other thing I should say about the market is. You know, once we do look at 
the way that we're organized is to try to um, focus on bigger markets. Um, but there are, you know, we see companies that are positioned in all sorts of markets. So we're, you know, we're looking for companies that are um, addressing big markets. You know, within healthcare, we're looking for, you know, solutions that maybe address um, uh, therapeutic areas like diabetes, uh, cancer. Um, you know, or, you know, or addressing big issues like you know helping payers transition from um, a fee-for-service environment to value-based care. So, trying to focus on what are those big areas and are going to allow us to um, have a company that can grow to a substantial size. Uh, so then we we look at the companies, and I'd say kind of a number of factors that we're probably looking at as it relates to the companies. Um, you know, one is just uh, you know what sort of product or solution do they have. Um, you know, so we're often, you know, those could be in a various stages of development. Um, they could have a, a product that's, that's pre-revenue and not in the market yet. Um, they might have a product that has, a, you know, a few customers. They may have more traction. So we're trying to get a sense of kind of what's the product that they have, um, you know, how, how attractive do we think it is relative to the competition. Um, you know, considering factors like, you know, what sort of IP do they have, um, you know, the, the we're, we're we're often not going to be the experts on, you know, what are the sort of specific technologies in the product. We're often looking for customer validation because I think a key question that we have is just are customers going to buy it? And do you have some evidence that, you know, either customers will buy it or, ha or have bought it? Because I think, you know, a lot of companies are, are, um, that we're seeing today are, it's a cool idea, um, but it's not clear actually that, uh, that a company, that, that customers are going to buy it. So we're often kind of looking to a company and then, pretty quickly talking to potential customers to try to get either actual customers or potential customers to get a sense of, you know, is this something you would buy, you know, at what price point and how much. Um, so we're looking at, at kind of those product um, related features. I think I'd say the stage of development of the company is pretty important. So I, I sort of talked about, um, is it pre-revenue? Does it have a little bit of revenue? You know, we often bucket our companies as pre-revenue up to $5 million in revenue, five to $20 million, and then 20 and plus. And so, you know, we're often looking to invest in either pre-revenue or ideally something that's kind of zero to five million in revenue and then, and then trying to move it along in those stages and really accelerate the commercialization. So I'd say um, the stage is important. Um, the, uh, the, the management team is, is very important. So, you know, we often talk about the fact that we're not, um, we're not necessarily investing in um, in a company um, or even a product. We're investing in people, um, so you know we do a pretty heavy job, kind of you know screening those people um, and, and trying to get a sense for that. Um, you know, and so that, and then you know, and then we're thinking about kind of what what's the competition. Um, so how is your product going to be positioned relative to competitive factors? You know, why do you have a better product or solution than some of the other competitors? And that naturally leads us to um, you know what sort of so then as we think about there's an initial investment how much how much capital does this company need initially um, and then you know how much company do we think this this company needs in order to get to cash flow positive because most of the companies that we're investing in um, are going to be cash flow negative for a while we may put an initial round in that round will get the company to some sort of proof point um, you know the company gets uh, an approval from the FDA if they need that they get to um, a certain amount of customer traction, and then there may need to be more money going in, and then we're thinking about, okay, what, what's that exit down the road? Is it three years, five years, or, or longer? Um, and then, you know, what's what's kind of the universe of potential buyers at the end? So is it a, is it a direct competitor? Is it kind of companies that are interested in the space, but not necessarily a direct competitor? Um, and so what sort of, you know, multiple, like, might we expect to get, and like Brian said, we're often, you know, targeting something where we can put some capital in, you know, initial ongoing, and then ultimately get a three times return, or three times or better return on our money. So, um, the, the, I guess you can look at what we do when a company comes in as sort of like a funnel. You start off with the, big, the, the bigger issues of market potential, um, and generally, you know, where a company is in its development stage, uh, you know, doesn't already have a product, uh, doesn't already have uh, customer attraction, you know, where, where along that spectrum are they? Um, and then there's some very specific things to the company that it, you really start to dig down and do more work on once you've gotten 
to the point of figuring out whether generally you even want to spend the hour with the group or, or additional time going to visit them, etc. And I just think, you know, I can't emphasize enough what Seth said about man, the management. Uh, you can have the greatest idea in the world. If you don't have people that can accomplish it, and you can't, and you, if you can't develop the confidence in their ability to take the money from you and actually spend it wisely and achieve the results that they want to um, achieve as well as what we want them to achieve, you're, not, you're wasting everybody's time if you're putting money in, you know, behind people who don't have the ability to do it. You're not doing them any favors either, um, because it's it's uh, uh, who wants who wants to be the uh, the parents of a failure. Um, you look at the existing capital structure of companies. Since we're, we're not a startup uh, kind of uh, in, investor, so we, we don't we, we don't get the guy uh, or the girl who's coming in with I have an idea. Uh, my wife gave me an, uh, an office in the second bedroom that I'm working out of, and here's my idea. That, that's not what we do. We, we, we are further along. Um, you know, we want to get companies that are further along, and that typically means that there's at least been some other money that's coming to the company, first of all. And this, this, is, this is what leads into what we're really trying to talk about today, which is the kind of thought process, the terminology of how you strike a deal with somebody. Because one of the first things that you, where you, that really hits you in the face is, who else is in the company? How much money has already gone into pursuing this idea? Um, because the the whole concept of, <clears throat> of venture investment, the, re and the way it differs from other capital providers and capital sources, is that everything in venture is built around who gets the first money that comes out of a company when the company gets sold. I mean, it's as simple as that. Really. It's it. The terminology that attaches to that is, is preferences. Okay, um, unlike like if you go and look on the New York Stock Exchange, while there are exceptions, almost every company, anybody that owns anything in that company, that's publicly traded, owns the same thing. You know, owns some, you know, com owns common stock. Um, and while people will have different levels of influence based on how much of that stock they own. They don't have any better right to the value that's in that company than anybody else that owns that common stock. Venture capital is different. Venture capital, um, we own, we will only put money into a company if the $30 million that's already in the company doesn't come out of that company until we've been paid whatever we put into that, into that company on top of it. It's called being on top of the stack. And that's, that's the art of venture investing. It's figuring out what value is in a company, how much we're going to put in on top of that existing value, how much we're going to pay for it, and what expectation of return that we build into the terms that we agree upon with that company so that when that company gets sold, we will get our we will get our expected return out of it. Now you don't we don't want us to be the only one that makes money in a company because then there's no incentive for the management team or for anybody else that's already in the capital stack to remain involved or to continue to support the company. Um, so it's a very artful process of figuring out where that balance is for us to put money in and others to still have the ability to see their way to make a lot of money as well. So maybe that's a good segue to, you know, for Jason to touch on some of the more specific deal terms that we, you know, have. Sure, I mean, I guess it's to. good to start with preference then. I, 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 I like to, as Brian said it well, at how, how preference really works and you sort of put yourself on the top of the stack, you know, first in, um, or last in, first out, sorry. Um, and I think for a lot of investors, sometimes that seems like an unfair trade. Um, but I, if you sell it to them, it's a good way to sell it to them in terms of it's more, you know, we're looking for downside protection for our return. Um, we actually want the larger upside. And, and typically how we'll structure our preferences is we get a, you know, a 1x participating with a 2x max. And, and to, to simplify that, we essentially get paid our, you know, our preference, say we put in you know, $10 million, we get our $10 million off the top of any transaction, and then we'll participate on a pro rata basis with common 
until we receive $20 million. Um, if the X is bigger than that, we convert to common and we all share equally. So you kind of sell that to the investors by saying, hey, we're all looking for 3, 4X. So eventually that preference, that 1X falls away and we all just share. And that's, that's the ultimate goal here. Um, but we need some sort of protection for the return on our, on our investment. Um, other ways, um, other terms that we use um, are that we include for our economic side as dividends. Um, you know, usually it's between six and eight percent dividend that just accrues. Um, it can either be cumulative or non-cumulative. So when you have a cumulative dividend, it does accrue over time, um, and that is again more downside protection for us. Gives us a return on our investment if the exit transaction isn't as lucrative as we want it to be. Um, sometimes um, companies will negotiate a non-cumulative dividend. It's essentially a dividend that. It could be 8%, but if, unless the board would declare that dividend, it never gets paid on an annual basis. And um, I, I, in my opinion, I call those non-dividends, but they're still there as a protection for us so the board can't declare a dividend without paying us a dividend in a given year. Um, I think those are the two major economic terms that come into play in a deal. Um, and then there's other protections. Um, then you get into more of what I consider control. Um, and for us, it's, it, it's a big... You know, that's a big concern. We like operational control. Um, we like to be able to influence management. Um, that sits at two levels, the board level um, and then also at the shareholder level. The board level, you know, we're trying to get not board control, but a few seats on the board so we can influence management and have a, a meaningful say in the operation of the company. Um, at that level, it's tip, um, you, you know, the board are subject to certain fiduciary duties. So there's, there's you know, limitations on actions they can take that benefit safeguard. They have to take actions that benefit the company as a whole. Um, so those, you know, when we institute protections uh, and control on those levels, it's mainly an operational level. We don't want to put in too many sort of, you know, significant economic terms protecting our rights at the board level that we have control over. We want those to fall to what we call protective provisions um, at the Series A level um, or Series B level, whatever level we're investing at. And that'll be a set of key fundamental business decisions, sort of exit transactions, you know, sales, issuance of additional securities that we want to be, able to be able to say you can or can't do that without fiduciary duty concerns. Yeah, just, just to, to clarify, because we, we do tend to use terminology, and I stop and think that it's not terminology that people know. Jason mentioned, you know, the Series A, Series B concept. So that's just sort of a, a typical nomenclature that when somebody goes out and starts a, uh, once you start a company, the first money or value that's contributed to that, that effort, that opportunity, is typically uh, a credit card. Okay. Somebody starts charging money on their credit card, that's all personal. Then when the credit card gets tapped out, the next step is you go to um, your Aunt Ginny, your Uncle Bob. That typically is referred to as a friends and family group. Okay? Friends and family, very unsophisticated group and it's it's you know, the entrepreneur literally going around the Thanksgiving Day table and asking for for contributions to help his effort um, with very little definition about what you own, what rights you have, um, and that mo many many enterprise mo most enterprises never get past that point. You know, then you just have. Uh, smaller Thanksgiving Day dinners because <laughs> the entrepreneur's man and uncle, and uncle Bob and Aunt Ginny doesn't talk to Uncle Bob anymore, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but once you get past that point and you start to get a little serious about the potential for a company to really do something, you get to a point where the typical next step is what's called angel investors. Angel investors are more sophisticated than Aunt Ginny and Uncle Bob. Um, but they do they are not typically not typically organized in a fashion like a venture fund it's wealthy individuals who are now no longer working for a living who spend a good amount of their time putting money into startup enterprises a couple of different flavors of of uh, angel investors one side of the coin can be much closer to the friends and family where you, where you don't necessarily have a lot of complexity to the terms that they put money in. The other end of the spectrum is it looks very much like an institutional round from some, vet, from some angel uh, investors, and they're, they're more practiced about how they put their money to work because they're doing it as a business undertaking. They really are out there holding themselves out to, to do that. 
Um, once you get past that stage, that's where you start to interact with the safeguards of the world uh, and, the, and, the, and the venture funds that are out there. And you, you typically then have a first institutional funding round, which is referred to as Series A, most typically. And that's just the first, the, if, the, if the set of documents are this big for the collective history of the company to lead or to get you through the angel round, the next set of documents is that thick to get you to the A. And that's where you, you really are starting to define what people are going to get out of the enterprise uh, in a worst case scenario. And, and as Jason said, that's the most important thing. People are protecting against downside risk, okay? You're not, you, you don't put these, put these uh, preferences in place to, to define how much you're going to get out of a huge win. You put them in place to define, to define who's really going, what kind of protection you're going to get at the bottom. You know, when things don't go as well as you want, you, you take it up to, a, up to a point where you believe you're being fairly compensated for the risk that you're taking um, for getting into the transaction when you do. And the, the biggest upside is you go outside of all the, you know, outside of everything you've built when there's huge, when there's huge wins, okay? Um, the, uh, we didn't talk about valuation. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that we, that we, we, yeah. we sort of skipped over. So why yeah, don't you, you want me to talk about valuation? Okay, so um, we often talk about pre-money and post-money valuation, you know, which are these kind of arcane concepts if you've, or, you know, it doesn't necessarily relate to something that maybe you've done in a corporate finance class. Um, so pre-money is just, um, you know, how much money, how much is this company worth before any new money goes in? And then the post money is how much is this new company worth now with new money in? So it's, it's sort of simple math. There's a pre-money plus an investment amount and you get to the post money. Um, and then, money's not so simple. Well, pre right. Simple. Post money is simple, right. And then there's, there's sort of options and I, I won't go into that, that part of it. But I think the, the point is where do you set the pre-money? Um, and that is very much more of an art than a science. I think that you can try to introduce some scientific tools into it. You know, if the company has X amount of rev revenue and, you know, you've seen other deals in this space and, and, they, and their pre-monies were at a certain multiple of, of revenue and you can apply it there. But, but generally it, it's an art and it's, it's often a point of negotiation between um, the uh, entrepreneur and the investor because it defines critically how much ownership is parsed out of the company. So it, it's saying, you know, number one, for um, existing, existing owners of the company, which is often the entrepreneurs, as Brian mentioned, some friends and family, some angel or seed investors, how much do they own of the company? And then this new money coming in, um, how much will that own of the company? So just to kind of give a mathematical example, just so you can wrap your head around it. You know, we might look at a company where we say, you know, the, the pre-money is $20 million, um, the um, investment round is going to be $10 million, and so the post-money is $30 million. So what that, what that essentially means is that this new investment coming in will now acquire an ownership stake of a third of the company, and the sort of existing owners or investors um, have two-thirds ownership over the company. And so, kind of, you know, that's critical for us because one, as Brian said earlier, you know, we're looking for kind of 20, you know, ownership share of 20 to 50% of the company. So we're often thinking, okay, well, how much is that new money going to buy? And then, you know, entrepreneurs are, you know, and, and maybe any existing friends and family and seed investors are trying to protect their ownership stake. So they're often trying to kind of move the pre-money as far up as possible. And we're trying to move it down. And it's not that simplistic. Um, but I think, you know, that's often a point of negotiation with the entrepreneur. The, um, the, an interesting point rises out of a uh, description of how, how important the valuation is. There are things that sort of run contrary to what an entrepreneur's initial logic might be. An entrepreneur might want, might want to say, I want to take as much money as I can if I can get it. Well, the magic of it is that you need to take money when you, when you need it and when you can map the use of that money against where that money will get you so that either you're going to get to break even, at which point 
you have a lot more options available to you about where you go for your next dollar of financing. Um, or whatever the other, whatever the, the metric is that's going, that you need to achieve for the next time you go out to get money. So let, let's say someone walks into us um, with, with a great idea. Um, we very quickly start bucketing that company into the thing, the, the valuation um, milestones that that company will have to achieve for us to consider that company to be successful. So let's say the first thing is to, somebody walks into you with a, with a product that is really only a beta product, only a beta technology. Um, we figure out how much it's going to cost that company to get to the point where they have a uh, kick the tires, foolproof, hardcore solution for somebody. And because that will be a very important value value driver for that company. So we don't necessarily, and if they can't get there, there's no point in them having money to spend beyond that point. So we'll try to figure out what that, what that is and tailor our thought processes around where that company needs to get. So instead of the entrepreneur walking in and saying, I want $20 million, the conversation is, you need $3 million to get to your next valuation. That then plays into what Seth was talking about, because you have to con you have to always be looking forward. So, okay, I'm expecting this company to accomplish this with this money, and at that point, I'll want to put more money in. But what value will what will the value of that company be then for me to put money in? So it's it's a constant. It, there's a constant calculation going on. It's not just here's 10 million bucks. And let's you know let let's start counting the the money that's going to come back to us in five years. It's it's much more practice than and this is all about making money. Remember, the, the innovation typically drives the conversation that you're having with the entrepreneur. Obviously, we're not gonna, we're not interested in putting money into the next bank, you know, or excuse me, the next uh, desk maker, unless they found some innovative way to make that desk. Okay. But we're only doing it not because we want the world to have better desks. We're we're putting it in because we think that we can make a lot of money, and that the people that are in the management team can make a lot of money doing it. But it's you can't just throw money at these at these opportunities. And typically, like you guys are probably you know a step below the age, or or right at that cusp of the age that we're the, the youngest entrepreneurs we see. You haven't done it before. We've done it. We've done it a million times, and typical venture investors have done this a number of times. So th there's a constant dialogue that goes on that's tainted by the fact that you have people on one side of the table who have done this time and time again with people on on your side of the table that haven't. Okay, um, advisors end up helping bridge that gap, but it makes all these conversations much more. Attenuated than, than they could otherwise be if I was sitting across the table from Rufus all the time. You know, if you just bang it out, there's always this, this soft up the, the soft stuff that has to go along to make sure that you're you're not ruining a relationship before you get started because of the you know, the, the, the kind of dialogue that you're having about how much com how much somebody's company is worth. So so there's a bunch of other stuff we could talk about, but I, I, I know we don't have a whole lot of more time, but we have. A, I want to leave some time to a just talk about questions that you might have or uh, uh, the things that we've said that didn't quite make sense. Um, as well as I wanted to give you guys a chance. You know, I, I, my my background is sort of irrelevant. I've been doing this too long to help you think about how you want if you wanted to end up somehow involved uh, in the venture side of the world. But these guys are much closer to uh, where you are, and they can. They would be happy to answer questions about how they've got where they are and the kind of career path moves that they've made, whether on purpose or just by happenstance that have gotten them to be you know, so deeply involved in, in these kind of transactions at such a age. So it's open up to questions on any of those fronts. Um, and Richard, too, you, you, you're, you're welcome to, to poke, poke holes at things we've said or. You know, 
That's the first question. Just a quick question about the funding round. So the seed investment stage would be anything from credit card to angel investors, and then anything above that you consider the Series A when you move past the angel investor. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, yeah, um, this is sort of a, a new phenomenon. Not, not, not new phenomenon, but there's a there's a thing called actually Series C raises, which I, that's what sort of Brian that almost mimic a Series A, but they're not really a Series A. And sophisticated angels would do those. Um, another possible problem is a bridge financing, so people will take in debt immediately prior to doing a Series A round just to bridge themselves to that. And all that really is is another version of a preferred security. So yeah. it's, it's and not not a. None of that terminology. There's no book that says you have to call this a Series A. It's just the nomenclature that's that's developed over the years. And really, what it what it comes out of is when I think at least most of you have probably been exposed to how you get a corporation started. You, know, you file a certificate of incorporation with articles of incorporation, you know, depending on what state you're in. And <clears throat> typically. That's a very simple document that says, you know, we authorize a thousand shares of common stock, par value of any, you know, yada, yada, yada. When it starts to get, when you start to want to define what you own versus what I own in a company, you have to take that document and amend it to provide for all of these rules of who owns what. And the most typical thing is that you create a bucket of preferred stock. And the first piece of that bucket that you take out <clears throat> and define, you call it A. And then the next one you call B. And the next one you call C. Now, there's all sorts of permutations of that when you want to go back and reopen an A round and you don't need to get that. So there's no, you know, there's no magic to it. It's just instead of saying series one, series two, somebody chose the alphabet to start with. Um, would you mind uh, describing some of the decisions that you made that led you to this area? This area? Sure, so I'll start. Um, so I um, spent, I, I came to venture from management consulting, so I spent a number of years in consulting before going to business school, and then I returned to consulting after business school. Um, I was interested in healthcare investing you know, pretty early on, actually my first consulting project. Um, it was with a company that was interested in getting into healthcare. They were a chemicals company and was looking to get into healthcare. So we were looking at a bunch of um, venture backed companies that we thought could make attractive acquisition targets for them. Um, and so, so that led me to an interest. I, I then I consulted for, um, was doing venture consulting for big companies, often Fortune 500 companies, um, and worked with companies um, in lots of industries, but largely um, in healthcare. Um, I did work in. Um, in pharmaceuticals and med device, um, and then spent more time later um, in my time in consulting working for health plans. Um, and so kind of was always interested um, in investing, um, had sort of, you know, looked a little bit um, uh, in 2008. So what my story was, I looked a little bit in 2008 um, when uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. I was living in New York and Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and I said, this is probably not a good time to be looking for a new job. Um, so, so literally, it was literally that night I was watching um, people walk out of the Lehman Brothers building with their um, with their boxes. I said, I'm going to sort of take the GMAT and do the business school route. So I went to business school and, and then went back into consulting, but was always interested in it. Um, and then, um, you know, connected with some of the folks. You know, was I was living in New York and then I grew up in Philadelphia. I just moved back to Philadelphia, and so connected with some of the folks at Safeguard. Um, and they, you know, are. They were, and we are looking to actively add to our deal team. Um, so, kind of came in. We've hired myself and one person before me now from a healthcare um, management consulting experience, um, and so we've had some success there. And I, I came on board generally this year. How about the legal side? Yeah. Um, so, my my base background is business. So, I, I went to Arizona State. I did a uh, BS in finance, um, and that's sort of for a couple of years. I worked in New York in banking. Um, uh, well, less than a year and a half, actually. Um, and then decided I would go back, and I actually originally went back just to get my MBA. Um, and then um, my actual father taught me to go to law school. Um, so, but I decided to do both at the same time. Um, and then all through law school, I was still thinking that um, I probably was going to go back to the business side. Got it, you know, a job with John and Morgan Lewis and decided to take that. Um, found a good business and finance practice group there that had an emerging growth practice. I always sort of you know, like the venture scene, um, something I wanted to get into more on the business side uh, originally. Um, but yeah, this offered me a great opportunity to do that. Um, 
we're there for almost 10 years, learning from you know some of the best lawyers um, that do this. Um, and literally, this is my but fourth day, fourth day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Hey, uh, just to put a little uh, umbrella on that, it's very typical for us to hire um, people who have come out of an MBA program um, and gone to a bank. Uh, and by bank, I don't mean a you know, commerce bank. I mean one of the investment banks, and gone through you know one of their training programs because they run fabulous training programs, and you get all the all the things you didn't learn in in school, you can expect to learn in those training programs. Not just and by training program, you're going through you're you're there for two years. Or, two years is right. Yeah, uh, you're getting hands on. Work till three o'clock in the morning. Experience. I mean, and it's, it's really the only way to learn um, you know, all, all of the, the ins and outs of what it takes to be valuable in you know any any investing enterprise, uh, and obviously that includes uh, venture. Um, we do have uh, we do often hire people at the associate level who have not yet gone to business school. Uh, but who came out and went to work somewhere in the finance industry? Most most typically, you know, we usually don't get somebody from industry, you know, from one of the the healthcare or technology side of the world. We get them from uh, the finance side of the world. Uh, they'll come in, work a couple of years, and use that as their vehicle to go along to business school. Um, so there's there's a couple of different paths. I, I myself, I, you know, I, I uh, came out of law school. Um, I didn't know what venture capital was. It, it, it wasn't in the Philadelphia Education Department. Wasn't it? it still isn't a, a, a big sector in Philadelphia. But I was lucky enough, by happenstance, to get a firm that did a lot of work with Safeguard Scientific and all the, the different venture and private equity groups that Safeguard helped spawn because people who trained at Safeguard went out and opened venture funds and private equity groups. And that's in fact how Rufus and I met through you know, someone who had been in Safeguard who was off doing something great, um, and we, we connected when Rufus came, came down here. But th there's no defined path. Uh, but if you're on if you're in the law school, taking the business classes that give you the the, the just the um, the comfort of looking at a balance sheet, looking at a business, and figuring out what you think it makes sense. Not 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 the market stuff. Like you're not going to get. You're not going to, I don't think you're going to develop in school the kind of work that Seth, that, that Seth is, is, does daily in looking at markets and opportunities in the market, whether a company fits within that marketplace. But just getting the comfort level of being able to look at a business in general and see whether it makes sense to you on paper um, is something that the lawyer should uh, definitely want to be doing. And I think that's what he was just trying to you know, facilitate with this the center for. You know that he's that he's operating, and on, from the kids that are from you guys from the business school, you know the legal side. You know you want a lot of people kind of point fingers at lawyers and say, oh, they're the ones that you know that the world that all the world's ills are are based on you know because of the lawyers. Um, the legal side, I think, what what that really lends to to working within the venture world is the the ability to look at to look at issues in a in a very Dispassionate fashion, and be able to, you know, figure out uh, problems with that sort of law school analytic uh, capacity that you build. I know that's helped me. You know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to take any business classes when I was an undergrad, and I had the opportunity to go to Wharton when I was at law school, and I didn't take that opportunity. So I, I, I can tell you from not having done all those things. Having a cross pollination from both sides of the world would help, would help you tremendously. Questions? Sure. There's been some rumblings about outside money coming into Philadelphia, uh, more in like the real estate development side right now, but also other companies coming. Do you think venture capital is going to grow in the area because of that, or do you guys see it being stagnant? Well, it, the it, and you guys ch chime in, but the what. Money being based anywhere is a function of whether there's opportunity in the area. Okay, so the more success that we as a as a region have in building up the 
the base of entrepreneurs and people who are doing exciting things, the more of those that are here, the more people are going to want to be here to, to, you know, to, to look for places to put their capital. Um, um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, sort of the only places to go, or the, the only places that would have a uh, you know, big star on the map if you, did a, you know, if you did a rendering of the United States for where there were strong pockets of uh, venture were Silicon Valley. Um, there's a loop around Boston, that, uh, Route 128, I guess it yeah. is, that there were a bunch of people centered up there, um, there was, there was, and those that was, was the, it. Well, but a research triangle, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Okay, which was a, but down down in the Carolinas. Um, but now, New York has blossomed into be like, even though New York was was way up high on the scale for every other kind of financing, venture wasn't something New York paid any attention to. Now, we our guys spend a good half of their time sourcing transactions. Uh, because of the communities that have been built up in New York. Um, we do a lot of Philadelphia deals. We try to do a lot of Philadelphia deals. But if, if, I, if I'm going to be frank with you, the, the, the flow that we see from Philadelphia-based things, especially in the, within the, 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 the technology side of what we do, is not as high in Philadelphia. The healthcare side has been growing. Um, at, you know, Seth can tell you in particular because that's, that's the side of the world he works on. Um, because of the, the pharma businesses, you know, that's a lot of customers. Because of the health systems, that's a lot of customers. Um, because of all the universities, um, you know, there's been more and more of that. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is, we certainly hope so, because that, that will help, up, help us, because it means that there's, there's more and more activity here, and I'd, I'd much rather have our guys driving down the school to see an opportunity than flying to Minnesota. But flying anywhere, you know, it's just cheaper. It's it's more economic, more economical way to, to run our business. So. Anything else? Maybe one more question. Sure. Uh, the, the verticals that you were talking about, say, um, so you don't in technology. You say you don't invest in, in the Googles. Uh, I guess because you say mostly consumer-based product. So what type of verticals within technology would you come like safeguard? Once you put, once you go through the funnel and you pass a lot of other the, the initial testing. What verticals and technology does your company like to invest in? So help me out here, Brian. But so my my sense of technology is um, and just yeah. Seth. Well, while we all participate in discussions about all the companies, you know, Seth's <coughs> main workday is spent on the healthcare side. So yeah, but we so, so we talk about, him if he doesn't get. I know he's I know he's talking about three technology verticals, um, and I think I know two of them, but I'm I'm a little unsure of the third. Um, so one of them um, is enterprise technology. I think we talk about sort of tech, uh, enterprise 3.0. Um, so we're looking at things that are being you know sold to kind of big enterprise customers and are making you know s something about that. Um, like CRM uh, systems and that kind of thing. could be, that yeah, thing. yeah. With right. everything moving to the cloud, that, and, and that you hear all the talk about SaaS. Mm -hmm. Well, things that are that where where people are taking enterprise level information management systems to you know to the cloud and providing for um, you know the next level of you know the next the, the, the next step in technology development you know, at, at a big company versus you know something that is that is aimed at um, mid-level market kind of kind of companies so um, financial technology would be the second vertical so that's financial services broadly um, so we have Things that are um, kind of more uh, what you would consider kind of traditional financials and um, uh, not revenue cycle management, but, but things that are sort of related to billing and, and whatnot. There are things that are insurance um, related that we've invested in. Um, so kind of a, a broad bucket within fintech. And then I want to say the third is ad tech. Um, yeah, ad tech. Would that be right? Okay. Yeah. So ad tech, digital media. I think we did, we've looked at a couple things in that. Um, but uh, and there's yeah. all tend to be things that are. The, the, the commonality is that, the, the, that these are things that are aimed at being sold to a business customer and that ultimately the user of the technology is typically a business user, not a consumer user, and we certainly aren't selling anything to consumers. Um, 
So then on the healthcare side? Yeah, so on, on healthcare, we, we talk about kind of two areas. We talk about um, med tech, um, which we define as um, either kind of uh, medical diagnostics or device diagnostics. Um, so these are things that um, they, they may be, yeah, so they may be, so yeah, so a company that's local here um, uh, up in uh, King of Prussia is a company called Trice Medical. Um, they make a, um, a camera-enabled needle um, that en uh, enables um, uh, orthopedic diagnostics. So instead of, um, you know, if, if you believe that you have a, a tear in your knee instead of going for an MRI, um, which is a very expensive process and, and it could also just take a long time in order to get scheduled, um, they allow you to have a physician um, with a needle perform an in-office procedure um, that's much less expensive and much faster um, to determine, you know, if this is something that you need surgery on or not. Um, so that's kind of as, as far down the sort of med tech um, side as we go. Um, and then farther to the right um, is a company, it, or is uh, healthcare IT. So a company that, that Brian and I are involved in, in healthcare IT, a classic healthcare IT company is a company called Quantian D. Um, which is a company that's a, um, a physician relationship management platform that basically provides um, you know relevant content to physicians through um, th through kind of video and presentations means kind of social media. Yeah, it's a it's a peer to peer um, sort of thing that allows physicians to learn about topics that are interesting to them. Um, so uh, you know a fairly wide range of things that we'll look at with healthcare. Great, so with that, I think we'll have to, you guys can hang around for a couple of minutes to answer more questions, but we think that's good.